Good evening. On behalf of Northern Illinois University STEM Read and University Libraries, welcome to Future Telling. I'm Fred Barnhart, and I have the privilege of being Dean of Libraries here at NIU. These Future Telling conversations are, at their core, about hope. Hope that rational thinking will win out over fear. Hope that science will continue to help us make sense of the world. Hope that by working creatively and cooperatively, we can look forward to a better future. I'm very excited to bring you tonight's program, which we are calling Math and Physics Are My Superpowers, with our guests, authors S.L. Wong and Rebecca C. Thompson. S.L. Wong is an MIT-educated mathematician and has been both a Hollywood stunt woman and an armorer. Rebecca C. Thompson is not only a physicist, but also author of the Spectra, the Laser Superhero comic books, and head of the Office of Education and Public Outreach at Fermilab. Unfortunately, Don Peterson, NIU's Dean of the College of Engineering and Engineering Technology, had a scheduling conflict and won't be able to join us tonight. He sends his regrets and we very much look forward to him joining us in a future program. We would like to thank the Friends of the Library and NIU STEAM for their support. We'd also like to thank the Divisions of Outreach, Engagement, and Regional Development and Research and Innovation Partnerships for their commitments to community programming. If you're interested in supporting future telling, go to go.niu.edu forward slash future telling and make a donation of any size. Tonight's webinar focuses on superpowers. S.L. Wong and Rebecca Thompson have both explored the idea of characters with enhanced abilities. One of Wong's most famous characters is Cass Russell, a badass anti-hero whose lightning fast calculations make her not just the smartest person in the room, but also the most deadly. Thompson's Spectra comic books imagine how a young girl can change the world using the power of physics and lasers. Not only are they both interested in superpowers and the science of transhumanism, they both love to talk about swords. And I'm excited to see how this conversation will turn out tonight. Jillian King Gargile, director of NIU STEM Read, will moderate tonight's talk and then invite you to participate in Q&A sessions. The event will be recorded and posted on the Future Telling website. Thank you once again for joining us, and now I'd like to welcome Jillian and welcome our guests. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Hello, everyone. Thank hey, thank you so much. <laughs> well, it's, it's good to see you here, and I'm super excited about tonight's conversation. So uh, I want to start by having you both introduce yourselves and give people a little more background on your work. So let's start with S.L. Huang. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm S.L. Huang, and uh, thank you so much to Fred for that magnificent introduction, um, which pretty much covered it, but I'll, I'll show you some, some book covers. Um, this is my thriller series, <laughs> thriller series that he was talking about, starting with Zero Sum Game, and it's about a superpowered mathematician whose superpower is doing math really, really fast. And uh, she uses it to kill a lot of people, which is uh, what you do with math. So um, there are three books out so far, Zero Sum Game, and then Null Set and Critical Point. And uh, those of you who are math inclined may notice the math puns in the title, because it just amuses me. I love math. Um, I, am, uh, I was a math major at MIT, and uh, I just really dig math. All the time. People ask me sometimes if I do the math in the books, and the answer is definitely yes. <laughs> so I'll do like an after, a whole afternoon of calculations, and it'll end up like one line in the books because I don't want to bog the you know the action and the gunfight down too much. Um, I also have a book, another book coming out uh, in a week, no less than a week, six days. Um, it's my first fantasy. It's called Burning Roses, and it is a fantasy a fairy tale retelling of where Red Riding Hood is a recovering assassin. And she teams up with Ho Yi, the archer from Chinese mythology, and they have incredible adventures and angst about their families a whole lot. Oh, and they're both queer middle-aged women, because uh, that's kind of my brand. Um, so that's about what I write. And since we're talking a lot about you know, transhumanism and stuff here, too, I'll mention that I also do write a lot of short fiction um, that deals with themes of medical technology and uh, advancements of uh, interfacing technology with the human body and uh, looking into the near future kinds of advancements that way um, that I try to make very socially conscious and like examining themes of, of our world. And um, and yes, I really like swords and I've been training in swords since like 
Oh, gosh. Um, for a lot of years now. I won't give away my age. But yes, uh, if it had the blade, I probably trained with it. Uh, Becky knows a lot more about the, the making of swords. I pretty much only know how to, uh, you know, fight somebody with them. But uh, yeah, Becky's really awesome. Take it away. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you guys for inviting me here. And um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I am a physicist by training. Um, and while I was in grad school, realized that what I wanted to do with my life is tell everyone else how awesome physics is. And so I did a hard pivot from research, and now I use storytelling in various ways to get people excited and engaged in physics. And so um, the Spectra, the Laser Superhero series, was one way to do that. Um, she fights such villains as the quantum mechanic and misalignment and general relativity, um, all with the idea of hooking middle schoolers on uh, physics, laser physics specifically, and having them walk away both enjoying a story and learning some science. Um, it's really hard to convince a bunch of uh, older physicists to fund comic books, um, but when you give demos to their uh, grandchildren who then very coherently explain lasers, um, turns out it works pretty well. Um, it's also impossible not to make laser jokes. So I had a lot of fun uh, designing Spectra, her powers, her world, and writing about that. Um, and that's one way I use storytelling. And then the other way is kind of coming at the problem from a different direction and taking a story everybody loves and gets excited about and putting some physics in it and explaining the physics. And so that's what I did with uh, my book, uh, Fire, Ice, and Physics, The Science of Game of Thrones. Um, and it's all about the cool physics that's in Game of Thrones that you might not have thought about. Like, can an ice wall work? Is that a thing? Um, can dragons fly and breathe fire? Um, and by far my favorite uh, thing to write about was swords and metallurgy and why swords do what they do and why the fictional uh, Valyrian steel uh, is so great and based on Damascus steel in the U.S. or you know in the real world. Um, so I had a lot of fun doing that and really just my goal in life is to get people hooked on physics. <laughs> awesome. So um, what is the I want to take the sword thing first from both angles. So uh, S.L. Huang, what is the appeal of swords to you? Uh, what do you like about them? Why do you use them? How did that factor into some of the stunts that you did? And then we'll talk to Becky about some of that uh, cool science behind the strength of steel. Uh, well, I mean, let's be honest. Swords are just really cool. So, yeah, that is that is my entire reason for being into swords. I, I cannot claim any other, like, you know, that, I mean, I love the history, and, you know, when I, uh, am, I, I've done mostly Western sword play, but when I do, like, Chinese stuff, it, um, it's also, like, feel, you know, I can say it feels some connection to my heritage or whatever, but really I just like swords, and I think they're really cool. Um, and I, I enjoy it as a, uh, an art form or sport or whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, I, I'm fascinated with it, and I'm fascinated and the, the, the longer I do it, the more I'm fascinated with our romanticism of it, you know, these deadly weapons. And they, they just have so much character and there's so much, we put so much emotion into the way we think of them, um, which I find absolutely fascinating. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I just love them. So from a physics perspective um, it, and a storytelling perspective, one of the things I loved learning about, particularly with um, how steel is made and Damascus steel, was the story that went into the science um, and how science really shaped human history to some degree. Um, steel was developed when the Bronze Age kind of ended um, because we had, in the Bronze Age, you had copper and tin, and they could be mixed together to create the alloy bronze. Um, but you don't find those two metals in the same area. So significant trade routes had to develop um, to create this metal. And then that all collapsed and people were like, well, crap, now we need weapons. What are we going to do? And so steel happened. Um, but steel is very complicated to make because the melting point of iron is so high and it took a long time to get fires that hot and then a long time to figure out how to separate iron from other things and then a long time to figure out how to make that into anything usable. And the just looking at uh, the way kind of history, like the, the civilization developed around the creation of steel was amazing. 
Um, and then thinking about it, you know, in relation to what's going on, or in relation to modern science, um, Damascus steel is this really neat steel that no one was able to create in modern times. People tried. Two groups starting in 1982 went back and forth and back and forth and said, you do it this way, no, you do it this way. It's this amazing story of the fight between two groups. Each paper was insulting the other. It was incredible. This is my cat. She's going to come say hi. I'm sorry. My husband's job was to keep the cat. Um, but her name's Dicey. She's super nice. <laughs> um, so uh, these two groups were going at each other and trying to be the first to create this, and neither succeeded. One group actually, uh, the leader of one group died before it was able to, you know, before they were able to confirm that it was Damascus steel uh, or that how to create Damascus steel. So. Then this group comes in and is like, you know what, we're just going to throw this thing in a really great microscope and see what we got here. Like, let's just throw it in there and see what we got. And what they found is that everybody had been trying to replicate this technology from the Middle Ages. And what had happened is a group of people had accidentally stumbled upon the perfect formula with the perfect trace elements, with the perfect amount of carbon, with the perfect method to get the exact right temperature. I mean, we're talking complete magic had to happen, and they created carbon nan nanotubes. So you've got medieval weapons that have carbon nanotubes at the edge, that surrounding steel that still nobody can recreate. And I love just the story of how steel has shaped human history, um, how it's used, how this pursuit for the ultimate weapon um, has really been, you know, just throughout history, things that people are looking for. It's amazing to me. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> oh, you're still muted. Thank you. I don't know why that was happening. I'm sorry. <laughs> you got me now? <laughs> all right. I said, uh, I was saying, speaking of fantasy, which we're all a fan of here, um, I feel like the alchemy that we talk about in fantasy, it's not gold. It's carbon nanotubes. <laughs> right? Yes, that's exactly it. It's like, and I love that it grounds it. You know, I mean, and the thing with fantasy is like you create a rule set, people jump in, and you can take them anywhere. And, uh, you know, as long as you play within your rules, people will follow you through a story. And I just love it when it can touch back into real life and it can just, you know, really have touch points back into what's actually, you know, what people will actually interact with. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's super cool. And I think this gets at this, this interest that you both have in weaponry. And so the Cass Russell books kind of deal with the near future of weaponry. And then uh, your Hugo Award-winning short story, uh, as the last I may know, talks about kind of the uh, like the ethical nature of using weapons and whether we should or shouldn't. So how do you how do you I guess first set up that um, those stories for the audience and let's talk about uh, just your views on the future of weaponry. Oh, wow. Uh, we're not pulling any punches here, are we? <laughs> um, I guess I do write about it. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, it, it's actually, I find I, because I've been a weapons professional for such a long time now, I, I get very serious about it um, in ways that, I mean, I talk about swords being cool, and I absolutely believe that. But I have also put an incredible number of thought cycles into the fact that these are dangerous weapons. And they're not only dangerous weapons, they're... Uh, 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 one thing that a sword instructor of mine used to say was that swords are the only weapon that's designed for their optimal purpose to be killing human beings. Like every other weapon that we can think of has some other uh, adaptation that we use it for. Like, obviously, combat knives are different from kitchen knives, but, you know, we use kitchen knives. We, we have them for a, a purpose that isn't violent. Um, you know, axes are used to chop wood. Guns are used to hunt, you know. Um, uh, the, these, but swords are so specifically for a violent purpose against other human beings. Um, and there, there's not really a, there are no kitchen swords, you know. 
and yet we we love them we romanticize them we put them in our fantasy we make them into their own characters we imbue them with magic you know and and i'm as you know into this as anybody else you know i'm not sitting in judgment here <laughs> the fact that we do this but it, it certainly is something that i think about a lot and also you know as somebody who has been a professional armorer in hollywood um and my job was doing the firearms for you know major movies and television um, and I also love firearms as a sport. Um, I actually learned to shoot at MIT and doing sport pistol. Um, and there's something about the focus of it that really, um, that I'm quite enamored with as something as a, a hobby. Um, but there, you know, obviously there are very deep questions there in terms of like the, what lines we should draw. Um, and certainly, you know, I put a lot of thought into this and I, I, I get very serious about it. I get very serious about like, people uh, not treating weapons respectfully enough um, in real life. Uh, you know, I'm very serious about like my gun safety and stuff like that. Um, so it's, uh, it's one of those things that I think because it is such a particular interest of mine that I have also put a lot, a lot of thought into the, the more challenging uh, aspects of it um, socially and emotionally. Um, and I, I write a lot of these things into my fiction. Um, and uh, as the last time I know is about weapons of mass destruction, which, uh, you know, until this moment when we're talking about this, um, whenever anybody asks me the inspiration of that, the, the truth is that it's, um, I went to the uh, atomic bomb museums when I was living in Japan uh, to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it, it was a profound experience um, those museums really wrecked me in a way that uh, was uh, very uh, educational for me um, and made me understand emotionally a lot more about um, what happened in World War II um, so you know I always talk about that as my inspiration but now that we're talking about this it, it's absolutely true that I I have for a very long time you know thought about weapons in general in all all sorts of ways because you know, as a fan of action and science fiction and fantasy, I want to be able to play with these things in fiction. But also, you know, I, I went to those museums and I I hadn't understood emotionally. You know, we use, like in Battlestar Galactica, we use, we're like nuking the ships and we just talk about it so lightly. Or we use nuclear weapons as our, our fun apocalypse creators for our dystopias. You know, there was a nuclear war and now there's a dystopia and we'll start the story there. Um, and I the emotional we, we don't uh focus necessarily on the social and emotional impact of weapons in our fiction a lot of the times which you know sometimes we don't want to because we just want to have fun but i think it's also important yeah absolutely i think there's books that you read you know because you want those space battles you know <laughs> you, you want the lasers you want you want things yes. blowing up and then when you sit back on your own especially in a short story I find or a novella like you can you can be a little more contemplative in that space I think um so we did a poll before the uh before the presentation started that was about uh types of uh basically enhancements or superpowers you might want and um I'm trying to remember what the, there, there were a few that were popular. I think flight ended up being the most popular. So I want to know what, we're going to get into transhumanism and, and things like that, but what, what superpower would you have? Would you have lasers? Would you have math? Uh, would you stick with what you've written about or is there something else that you're dying to have? <laughs> I, so I, 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 have, I went back and forth between flight and uh, eternal youth. And I think that the older I get, the more I lean towards eternal youth, because um, there's a lot I want to do <laughs> in life. <laughs> um, so I like that. But uh, I will say, when I was much younger um, in high school, I used to skydive. And I, you know, I've been in planes like my whole life. I don't even remember when my first flight was. And, and it's great. And you can get from point A to point B, and you get a drink, and it's wonderful. Um, but skydiving, it is such a different experience with how exposed you feel to the world. Um, my entire perception of, of 
like just relative perception of things is amazing. If you're trying to fall at the same rate as someone and it's a cloudless sky, one of you can move and you have no idea who moved. You just know that relative to each other, you're in a different spot, but you don't know who moved. It's the weirdest experience. And um, I would love to be able to experience that regularly without also the threat of death. So that's, I think I'm going to have to move back to flight because that was a, a pretty great feeling. I also love <laughs> skydiving. <laughs> it's so fun. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, you know, I tend to go for, uh, I would love to have different, like, uh, mental superpowers, things like, um, a superpower, like I, I, I'm a mathematician and I'm not an engineer, and this is something my engineering friends mock me for all the time, as they should, is I'm terrible at like building anything <laughs> or doing anything technical with my hands. Um, I'm all theory. So, you know, I would love the ability to just like build things out of nothing all the time, stuff like that. But I think, you know, stuff like those superpowers like those are always the ones that tempt me. But I think if I had to choose one, and I'm only thinking about this now because I always go back and forth on what I choose. But I think it would be math related. And I think it would be not the one my main character has, which is to do these lightning fast calculations that allow her to have, you know, the fun type of violence as we're talking about. But I think I would want to be able to control or influence probabilities. Because think how cool that would be. if Because every the world runs on probability, right? And to be able to, even if I couldn't control it 100%, if I could nudge probabilities and make things more likely and less likely, I think that would be really, really powerful. <laughs> we were that trying to pick awesome. superpowers. Yeah. We were trying to pick superpowers that had some basis and things that we were moving towards. So I always bring up jetpacks. And in one of the uh, the first future telling presentation, all of the panelists were like, jetpacks are stupid and terrible and we don't want them. And I was like, oh, no. Uh, but where where are we in terms of some of these things uh, scientifically, like in, in terms of being able to uh, become more than human in some way, like a superpower or uh, an enhancement? Like, how about flight? <laughs> I mean, I think we essentially have jetpacks, but they're not like, you know, they're not as easy and practical and convenient as we would like to be able to like step off out of our doors and fly. Um, and there are, you know, the rigs, I think you need a sport pilot license for some of the bigger ones that are like personal rigs where you can take yourself up in the air. And I disagree with your other panelists because I think it's really cool and I want one. <laughs> I mean, I would take a jetpack, but I will admit my uh, my the the total of my knowledge about jetpacks came from one episode of NCIS. So I, I don't have an extensive knowledge of what jetpacks are available. But oh yeah, I'd take one, like if offered, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think right now they just take you know they take a lot of training and they're they're just not very they're cumbersome and not not like fun flight the way we think of super powered flight but you know maybe we can get there and I'm all for it um, I, I think it would be very one of the most interesting things about jetpacks I think is that it enters us into a more yeah. three-dimensional world because if everybody starts traveling by jetpack suddenly we have like this traffic control in three dimensions which we you know we do that a little bit with airplanes and stuff but there it's like highly regulated but if we have that on the, the person level on the earth surface that's going to that's gonna be something. That's going to change I, I things a lot. I actually have a 75-gallon aquarium, which I love. We have great fish. And I, I'm fascinated watching them because they have that 3D motion, right? So they can, like, chase each other in 3D and in ways that I can never do confined to Earth. It's, I love watching it and putting together fish. You pick ones that are like, you want some that hang out on the bottom and some that hang out on the top and watching how they switch. I, I love it for exactly that reason. All of a sudden, they live in a 3D world where I'm confined to a 2D sphere. It's really kind of cool. We have 3D cities in science fiction, which always fascinate me. And yet, every time I've been in a city that has any three-dimensionality to it, I've gotten totally lost. Because <laughs> I've tried to go to the place, and I don't realize that I'm like, on the wrong level and that the road goes down underneath or something and I'm, I'm just 
I can I'm not instinctually able to find anything. An hour on upper Wacker and lower Wacker Drive. Like, what is that? <laughs> I, like, who did that? So, are we ready? Right. Is the question. Think, I mean, you, you, you think about even when you're walking down the hallway and you have another person coming at you, and you're like, "Oh, me, you, me." I, what if you had to do that in three dimensional space? Can we handle it? Um, but I think that's an interesting point too, because uh, SL Huang, you've written about uh, some characters who have had these, um, uh, you know, surgeries or enhancements, and it takes a lot of adjusting. I'm thinking of. Um, by degrees, dilatory, uh, and, and dilatory time, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thinking about having uh, robotic eyes and um, and we'll get to uh, mermaids, I'm sure, in a little while. But um, so can we adjust to it? And then that's, you know, how many people wanted uh, sight? So about 15% of us wanted enhanced sight. So that's something that's being moved towards and it's uh, popular in science fiction, but uh, do you want to talk about that story a little bit? Yeah, um, sure. I, you know, one of the things that I, that fascinates me about these types of body enhancements is that we, you know, we use them in our superhero stories a lot. And, you know, I, I'm somebody who's had a lot of health problems and I've had a lot of major surgeries and it is, it's rough. Man, it's hard to recover from this stuff, and it's hard to adjust, and it, a lot of times it's not necessarily better, it's just different, and um, it can be kind of orthogonal to like whatever you had before, and um, you know, we are making these strides with you know, different prosthetics, like that story in particular, um, part of the inspiration was a friend of mine who is an electrical engineer and was working on like functional uh, uh, prosthetic eyes that could theoretically uh, see and be attached to the optic nerve. And I'm not quite sure where that research is now, but it's, you know, it's being done. This is, you know, only a couple steps into the future. But, you know, as somebody who's had these, you know, intersections and experiences with health and disability, um, I, I, I think it's going to be very different from we expect, at least at first. It's not going to be like, oh, I can, you know, what, what's the TV show, Six Million Dollar Man, you know, I can walk in and walk out, or the Bicentennial Woman, all these, you know, where suddenly I'm this, like, amazing, powered, invulnerable person who can, you know, with just a little bit of time, easily adapt to, you know, shooting lasers out of my hands. Um, I think it's going to be a lot slower and a lot harder and uh, at first, a lot of it's going to be, you know, purely medical. Um, and even that, there's going to be a lot of uh, angst and social issues to navigate um, that, you know, where we're, we do see already in some of these, uh, you know, disability spaces. Um, and, you know, there's going to be a lot more of those conversations going forward about, about ethics and about choices and bodily autonomy and all that stuff. And I love digging into those aspects of it. Um, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, the fun aspects versus the social aspects. And, and the, the Cass Russell books are like very fun superhero, you know, they're, they're thrillers. Um, but the story you're talking about, I, I try to get into a little bit more of the, you know, well, what would this look like in reality? And what a little bit more thinky um, about uh, social issues. And so, Becky, uh, science-wise, what are some of the other things like invisibility? It seems like there's there's always people working on invisibility cloaks, right? Um, <laughs> what what's the? There's, yeah. <laughs> so invis invisibility is an interesting one because um, there's a couple different ways groups have gone after it. Um, one, there's there's you know, the, the idea of um, coming up with materials that bend light around an object. Um, and with that, it's hard to create materials that are big enough to do that in all wavelengths, particularly visible spectrum. Um, every, what, four or five years, three or four years, New York Times has a science piece. Oh, Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. It's going to, you know, it's like five years away. And it's been five years away for like 20 years. So um, there's... There's always, that's something that everybody's working towards, I mean, particularly for weapons, right? You, like, you want to be able to cloak your, you know, fighter jets. 
Um, but the issue is that the, the materials that they have are wavelength specific and not necessarily something you can do with all, you know, visual, with the visual light or, you know, what are I can see. Um, there's a group at Rochester that did this really cool thing and it, there's a great video of it where they actually, instead of trying to come up with a material to bend light around, just took lenses for, and for like 150 bucks, set them up in this perfect little, this perfect line so that you could, if you look straight down it, you can like put a pencil in most locations and it looks like it's just disappearing. And so the whole idea of invisibility is you just got to get the light around something and not back to the, the person that's looking. Um, you know, you don't want light to reflect off the object to get to your eye. And how you do that is different depending on who you are. And so I loved the, the Rochester one because it's like so visually stunning to watch and see that these things are disappearing. Um, and that's just, it's, it's just that visceral shock of it is so cool. Um, but more likely, if we're looking at invisibility, it's going to be a material that's created specifically to bend light in a way that it can't reflect off the object and hit your eye. Um, but yeah, if you, you know, it, there's different ways of getting the problem. Um, I also just want to do, everyone goes with the Harry Potter invisibility cloak. I, I mean, Harry Potter fan. Um, but just, just a plug for relating it back to Wonder Woman as well. Um, her entire island was invisible. Uh, so just, <laughs> I, I like using that example of invisible things because it was huge. So, <laughs> so uh, Becky, have you read, uh, are, are you familiar with Michio Kaku's books, uh, Physics of the Future and Physics A little of bit the Impossible? I I, I'm just, I'm curious. No. You, you, okay, I, I was curious if you'd read them because I was curious what you think because um, he ranks things as like, degrees of impossibility into the future. And I forget where invisibility is, but it's like, and you really enjoy them. I highly recommend them to you and to anybody watching. Um, they're, they're so fun and, uh, you know, very, very accessible no matter your level of physics um, and super sci-fi. Cool. All right, I'm definitely gonna check that out because I want to know what is, I, I feel like I would come up with my rankings and I want to know what his are, <laughs> so. I was curious whether you agreed yeah, with this. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm also curious whether or not I agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I will check that out. Um, so it's interesting that you bring up Wonder Woman, because I think um, both of you have talked about representation in sci-fi. Uh, so I wanted to talk about that. What got you into uh, both the careers and the creative spaces that you inhabit? And where do you see that um, representation heading in the future? How do you see it changing? Um, where where are we going next? Um, so I I think uh, I I think there's probably a lot of us that can say this, but I'm absolutely a product of the Scully effect. Um, huge X Files fan, and when I got to college, you know, just the idea of having seen this female character who was, you know, a scientist and not like, you know, a done up or you know, scientist or one dimensional. She was this. She was. The first character I'd seen that was allowed to be both feminine and a hard scientist, and I, I, I'd never seen that before. And I'm realizing now um, that con the movie Contact came out around that same time, um, so we had a lot of good representation kind of in my generation coming up. Um, and I just, you know, I wanted to be just like Scully. She was also from Annapolis like me. Um, and the fact that her character showed me I didn't have to pick one, um, I didn't have to be, I didn't ha I could be a scientist and also this fully realized, um, you know, human um, was wonderful. And what I found over the years is so many people kind of in my generation, in that X-Files generation, have a very similar story. And I was lucky enough in 2013 to actually get to the X-Files panel at Comic-Con in San Diego and like got to say that to her. Um, which was the highlight, I think, of my life. Um, and I still don't know how I managed to stand up while saying that to them. Um, but what that did is it launched the, a, a look into what that representation means. And so the Gina Davis Institute for um, Gender and Film looked at it very specifically and did, an, did actual research in how X-Files specifically impacts women in STEM. And it's a huge, huge impact. 
And so I love that there's now data that we can just point to research data saying, you don't think representation matters, here is why representation matters. And it, it is, I think, one of the first times I've been able as a scientist to point to data saying how important representation is. And, and you know, you can extrapolate that to anything, to, to, to race, anything, you know, representation matters. And I love having a graph I can point to to say that. The Gina Davis Institute does such incredible work. Like some of the statistics that they have, like um, that if there's, if a group is, uh, I think if it's like a crowd scene is 17% women or something, people perceive it as being even and stuff like that. Or if women are talking one third of the time, they're perceived as being, as dominating the conversation. And I, I like you, I love being able to point to these numbers when people are like, oh, well, you know, no, you're making a big deal about nothing. And it's like, no, this is, Actually, you know, this is a, a social phenomenon that impedes people and throws up obstacles in people's lives. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, I'm queer, I'm a woman, I'm a person of color, and representation is incredibly important to me. Um, publishing is still incredibly racist. Um, it, it is also sexist, less so than it used to be, but I, you know, we, we talk about things behind the scenes. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard. It's a hard thing for that to impact your career, right? Um, and to, to feel like this thing that, is, that shouldn't matter is very, definite, very, very definitely something that matters. And I feel like we're at a bit of a, a, a crossroads or a turning point where people are trying really hard and sometimes that itself leads to things that are really difficult to navigate as a person who is sometimes the focus of them for example i don't want i want to be able to write about cultural themes i want that to be okay for me to do but at the same time i don't want that to be the only thing i can do i don't want there to be this other extreme where if I'm not writing about a Chinese character, then suddenly my work isn't what's wanted. Or if I'm not writing about a, a queer coming out story, then that's like not, you know, th that that people, I, I don't want that to be the brand that people shoebox me into and or shoehorn me into and, and say, this is all you're allowed to do. Uh, so it, it's, it's really tough to navigate. Um, and you know, a lot, both the, both the, the bigotry that's a lot of times is very, like, people don't even realize they're doing it, the sort of, um, background, uh, discrimination, I guess, um, is, is hard to navigate, but then also the well-intentioned initiatives can be very hard to navigate also. And, um, it's very tiring. It's very tiring. Um, but it, it does, it matters a lot. And I completely agree with what Becky is saying in terms of, you know, seeing ourselves in books and movies and, and seeing different versions of people who are like us on some axis, because no demographic is a monolith, right? And just like we need female characters who are like every type of woman. We also need, you know, Asian characters who are every type of person um, and queer characters who are every type of person. And it, you know, that's that's so important to avoid having that like single stereotyped narrative. Um, and uh, we're we're still so long from from getting there. But <laughs> it's, it's interesting you mentioned the data about women talking specifically and groups, because um, one of the things I did at my previous job was um, evaluate uh, how students interacted with the Spectre comics and the activities that went with it. And it was teacher reported. So we would have teachers, we would have questions like, did girls participate as much as boys? Or who boys participated more, girls participated more? And it was teacher reported. So we always knew, thanks to that data, that it was going to be skewed. So if it said that boys and girls participated the same, we knew that boys were probably participating more. And if it said that um, girls participated more than boys, they were probably participating at about the same rate. And that that was mostly just 
helpful for to us. It wasn't data to be published, it was evaluation. But thanks to that research, it actually helped us unskew the data um, to some degree. I mean, obviously, it's, it's you know, subjective, but it helped us realize that even though it's saying boys and girls are participating the same, what that means is that, that they probably aren't. Um, so that was, yeah, that was just practically very helpful. I was reading uh, that in the Obama White House, uh, the women who were at a high level of, uh, of government there, they started doing a thing where when one of them gave a suggestion, one of the other ones would repeat it and, and give credit back to the person who originally said it. And, you know, I, I, I like to think that the Obama White House was very well intentioned uh, against sexism, but, the, you know, they still had found they had to do this and that this made an incredible difference to them being listened to when they started reinforcing each other then people would start taking their policy suggestions more seriously and, and hear them a lot more. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely very current still. Uh, I, I think that's interesting that, I mean, it's discouraging that they had to do that, but I do like that idea of amplifying other voices, you know. Um, so there's a lot of ways we could go with this, but uh, before we open it up to questions, I do want to talk about... Um, the little homo sapien scientist, because I think that that gets into ideas of, uh, you know, representation, transhumanism, and also what what would happen in your body if you do make these changes. Um, but it also has some really interesting biology. So if you could uh, give some people uh, background on that uh, novella, and let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> sure. Um I should have had that next to me. It's on my shelf. Um, it's uh, so the little Homo sapien scientist is a uh, it's a flipped science fictional dark queer retelling of the Little Mermaid. Uh, there's a lot of words in there. <laughs> um, so it's basically the Little Mermaid, except the the main character becomes a mermaid instead of the other way around. Um, and it's science fiction in like a parallel world to ours where she does this through DNA manipulation. And the mermaids are rather um, alien and uh, uh, they're not human-like really at all. Um, and, uh, and she's a scientist who spent her entire life like studying them and the, the sequence of events in the book causes her to, uh, to make this incredibly painful decision and um, it's based on the Hans Christian Andersen Little Mermaid, by the way, not the Disney version. So this is not a this is not a happy story. I've had people who want to like buy it for their young kids, and I'm like, I just to warn you, it's it's the it's the original one, the the really sad and dark one. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that that was very much. Um, I was writing that as I was sort of having gender exploration and coming to. The, the conclusion that I'm, I'm yeah, some some uh, stripe of gender queer and the uh, writing about this person who's falling in love with somebody who's another species and who don't treat gender the same way as anybody and I, I, I uh, any humans do and I I want to mention here that I, it's actually a trope that I tend to dislike that um, when the aliens or uh, other species that aren't human are you know the non-binary gender queer species, but I also I made sure I had a gender queer human character as well because I, I otherwise I just completely hate that trope. Um, and, and representation of humans really matters. Like we can't only be aliens and robots. Um, but I you know I wanted to dig into this idea. And the main character is queer. She's she's a lesbian, but then has to like start to explore these gender ideas. And even when they're at the beginning when they're trying to explain the weight that we as humans put on our sexual dimorphism is like uh, confusing to this other species who don't really understand why we put so much social importance on like these phenotypical characteristics. Like they understand the science of a sexually dimorphic species, but the, you know, the, the science and the way we treat things as a society uh, can be very, very different. Um, and I, I actually think the science of gender is incredibly interesting. Like I was reading a, a scientist, a biologist on Twitter who went through a, a whole thing about like what defines gender. And she said, well, you might think that it's, you know, chromosomes, XX or XY, but, you know, and then she goes into all the reasons that that's not necessarily true. 
Um, you might think that it's hormones, but you know, and all the ways that this is really, it's not a binary at all. At all, it's more like a, a probability distribution because the whole world is probability. <laughs> and and maybe and part of the reason actually that high school biology teachers don't do like cheek swabs in class and stuff is so that people don't find out something that they don't necessarily want to know about their gender um, because we don't. We th well, a lot of a lot of people, especially cis people, think it's so obvious, you know, that I'm this gender. But if they, you know, they don't necessarily even know what, you know, scientifically is inside their body, and 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 that's not what gender is socially. You know, it's not a scientific like my chromosomes, my hormone levels, whatever. It's my identity, and um, so I, I I do love digging into that intersection of science and uh, you know how we live our lives. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's there's so much to dig into in that story, too. But uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting is you have these um, the scientists who are very well intentioned and they're they're there for research. And then you have kind of a, a witch doctor who knows more about it than they actually end up knowing. Um, so um, so many interesting things. And also the thing that I really liked, because I, uh, <laughs> I, I was saying in the chat before the talk, like, I, I want to breathe underwater, right? You always have dreams where you're just like, I'm swimming underwater. And oh, yeah, that's fine. I can breathe underwater. Um, so I've always thought that would be a cool power. But then I was, you know, as you read through that story, um, there's just like the just the pressure, you know, and just all of the things that go with being deep underwater that humans just can't possibly handle. Um, so I think it comes back to that idea. Are we are we ready for these things? could we actually ever adjust to them? Um. And the mermaid was made for that uh, retelling because in the original fairy tale, she's in so much pain. Like the Disney version doesn't do this, but like her tongue's cut out, her legs are literally cut apart. And she's feel if she feels like she's dancing on knives, like it literally says in the fairy tale all the time. So she's in incredible pain all the time in this fairy tale. It's a very, very dark fairy tale. Um, and like to, to me that it makes a lot of sense that if you went under, if you underwent this incredible biological change that we're not really even very good at yet, that would enable you to live at these uh, deep sea pressures, that it would not be comfortable. It would not be safe. It would, you know, it would be very painful and eventually kill you. And uh, yeah, it's, so the Little Mermaid was a, a good vehicle yeah. for me exploring no. that. <laughs> for kids, totally for kids. Yeah, Disney just like yeah. this for everything. Good music. Yeah. It, it is good music. It is good music. I love the music. And and so Becky, you've explored some of the uh, some of the science of Disney movies as well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I um a wide range of things from uh the physics of Frozen to like here's eight ways to die um but and the biology of that but I love you know Disney is is I, I think killing it right now um uh, I know a lot of people disagree but um the Frozen series specifically uh partic particularly the first one has some amazing physics opportunities in there. And the cool thing about it is one of the things that I did, the cool thing about it is it works. And so one of the things I never want to do is be that killjoy that's like, oh, well, that could never happen in real life. Like, what fun is that, right? Like, we're in a movie. We're watching a movie because we don't want to be in real life. Like, so I don't necessarily ever like to, you know, tell people that this isn't going to happen. I want to say, oh, that's a great idea. Here's some real life things. And so I went through Frozen. And did various math, you know, various physics ideas, applied it to things. I loved the fact that there is a Disney song that uses the word fractals. Like, that's great. <laughs> so... Started there, you know, talk in a talk, I talked about fractals. What is that? Is snow, you know, are snowflakes fractals? What about ice crystals? It's a great jumping off point. Um, there's a scene where Kristoff uh, makes a snow anchor. 
which is this incredible intro to how friction works. And there's some real life demos you can do to essentially show why a snow anchor stops you from falling, why you can put rope in snow and not die. I think that's amazing. And there's this great scene where um, Anna and Kristoff are being chased by wolves, um, and they're going and they're going and they're going. And Sven makes this incredible jump. And, and you know, my question is, would he make it? And obviously, I'm not going to put this in a talk for kids if he doesn't make it, right? Because that's just cruel. So I watched this over. I learned about different types of reindeer and what the, you know, average dimensions of a reindeer are. So you can look at um, how fast reindeer go at takeoff, um, what the air resistance is for a reindeer. And there's small, uh, small species of reindeer that actually have um, kind of skin flaps that help them glide, which is where the flying reindeer idea came from. And if you put all of this together, you find that um, Sven could have jumped probably 10 Svens. So he could have made a leap of about 10 spins. And then, thank you, Disney, they do this great under, like, under Sven shot. And you can see the whole gap and the length of Sven. And it's like the jump is only seven spins. And he can make it. And I can go through this entire thing and teach kids about projectile motion and air resistance and, you know, acceleration and also say they're all good. They, they all lived. We all lived. And I love having that opening. And it's, kids, are, kids are into it because they want to know. And you can both tell them all this physics and reward them with, you know, hey, and it could work. And um, I loved getting to do that. I was, you know, Frozen 2, I cried at the end. Oh, my God. So I um, loved it. But I was, like, kind of frustrated that the whole plot hung on this water has memory thing because I can't defend that. <laughs> so that I can't do. Uh, we can talk about, I, it's like I could use that as an intro to talk about things that do have memory, like memory wire and other things, but I can't, I, I just can't even argue the water has memory thing. Um, but Olaf lives. <laughs> so, um, but I just, I love how much physics you can find in things like this but also how you can use it as a, a jumping off point, and also how not everybody's dead. You don't have to be the killjoy. You don't have to be the one that walks in and says, well, that could never happen. Um, if you approach it from an engagement instead of realistic um, perspective, um, you can really draw people into the story. And I love how the more physics I did in relation to Frozen, um, the, the more I understood why the story held together so well, it's based in our world, um, and we have an understanding of how things work. So Sven is jumping something that's 20 Sven lengths. We're going to feel uncomfortable, and we're going to jump out of the story because we feel uncomfortable. But when you have a world that we've been told obeys the rules that we're used to, and then it does it successfully, it, it, it enhances the storytelling because we're not pulled out because we don't feel good. And you can't always express why you don't feel good. You just know you don't feel good. And... Um, one of the kind of best examples of this in, you know, Game of Thrones, um, there's a scene where a merry band of idiots is north of the wall, and they have to, like, send word back to hopefully get a dragon up there. And it involves Gendry basically breaking the world marathon record and getting back to the wall and sending ravens that can now go twice as fast. So if you do the math out based on how long it would take the lake to freeze enough to hold a battle scene, Plus the average, assume a four-hour marathon. I mean, why not? Um, it looks fit. Um, look at average raven speed and look at dragons. The timeline isn't terrible. <laughs> it's nowhere near as bad. But it really didn't matter because everyone was stuck on that couldn't have happened. Where did they get the chains? How, like all of these nitpicky things that most people didn't nitpick hurt everything and it hurt the story because you don't want to have to defend the physics of your story because at that point no one cares. You have all of this amazing narrative happening and the internet only cared about where did they get the chains and how did Gendry run that fast. Like that's a storytelling fail at that point. Um, but it's a great way to highlight how important good science is for a story to keep you as, 
keep you part of it. And I love that. Disney I love that you can talk about well. Disney and Game of Thrones in the same uh, short answer. That's very impressive. But um, <laughs> we are we're going to open up the Q and A so people can start uh, putting questions in the Q and A box, and we'll go through them. But um, I do want to touch on your Game of Thrones uh, and all of the grossness that you cover in your book. And also, uh, like in uh, Little Homo Sapien Scientist, the, the idea of the anglerfish and how they reproduce and uh, just like <laughs> just the weirdness of science. Like what what are some of the weirdest things that you two have uncovered in your research or the grossest things? Uh, that you just have to share with people? So, oh, uh, well, the thing thing is, is real. Um, it is, uh, they, when they, the males burrow into the flesh of the female, and this is like part of their life cycle. And so many deep sea creatures are so weird. So weird, like we can't. This is this is a big part of that uh, that um, little uh, story. By the way, I, like my fascination with how strange deep sea creatures are. Like there, there's a jellyfish. Um, it's in the it's in the story. I forget the Latin name now, but it's um it's literally immortal. It just keeps reverting to pupa stage. It can be killed, but it like it doesn't die of old age. And like we don't know how to. You know we don't. We have no idea. Science doesn't know. So this is, you know, this is something that like, it's just fascinating to me because it's like, when we say truth is stranger than fiction, it's this stuff, you know, it's fascinating. Um, and yeah, and I, I love what you were saying so much, Becky, about the, uh, like not being a killjoy, but then also like, I think when we, when we geek out about stuff, that's like part of loving it also, right? So like saying like, oh, it's fiction, this is great, we can just like, you know, we can enjoy it for not being scientific, but then also, let's also dig into the science because that's part of being a fan and is fun. And like, even, and then some people are like, oh, you know, well, that's, you know, taking the joy out of it. And it's like, no, it's not. This is just so much fun. So anyway, I love hearing about your book. Please talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the one that makes everyone the most uncomfortable. And I, I have a problem where when something's going on in my head, I tend to share it. Um, my husband calls them Beck X talks, and um, I just will go on about whatever I'm thinking about. And so a number of people had to endure Beck X talks on incest, because um, there's an entire chapter on incest. And this is the thing that makes everybody, everybody universally never invite me back to a cocktail party, is... Um, one of the most interesting papers, so first off, you're more likely to be attracted to someone that looks like you than not. Um, and there's a, a, a psychological effect where if you're raised with someone, you're not, you're like immune from being attracted to them. But if you go to a family reunion as an adult, there's a good likelihood you'll be attracted to a cousin or sibling or, you know, and, and so don't go into any family reunions as an adult unless you want to fund a psychologist's kid's college fund. So um, the, 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 there's this, people have studied that. And then there's a paper um, about, that came out where they did research on everybody in Iceland. So the genetic material of everybody in Iceland is in a database. And you can apply to query that database. And they wanted to see where kind of the relationship cutoff is, like how close is too close to be related to someone to have kids. And um, so what they looked at is how related everybody was and, you know, to their, their partner and how many kids they had and how many grandkids they had. And what they found was that uh, if you were first cousins with someone, every, which, you know, happens more than you'd think, um, if you're first cousins with someone, um, you, you have kids, there's not a lot of increase in, you know, birth defects or anything, um, and they have some grandkids. If you're second cousins with someone, you know, you have more kids generally and more grandkids. Um, if you're third or fourth cousins with your partner, you have the most kids and the most grandkids. But if you're fifth cousin or farther, you have fewer. There's a maximum amount of being related. So you are statistically, and again, this is statistics, more likely to have more kids that are considered fit, meaning they go on to have grandchildren, if you are fourth or uh, third or fourth cousins with someone, 
So marry your third or fourth cousin if you want a lot of grandkids. And this makes people wildly uncomfortable. And um, in Victorian Europe, they actually went through a, thing, a, a, a phase where even though statistically if you marry your cousin, you, there's like a 5% increase in, you know, birth complications. Um, in mid, in uh, Victorian uh, Europe, they wouldn't let you marry someone unless you could prove you weren't related at all. So even fifth cousins, if you were related at all, if you could trace back to a fifth cousin, you couldn't get married, which is kind of the opposite of the best way to have the most kids. It was, it's so, which is because people were so uncomfortable with it. But the statistics of um, incest and genetics versus the social taboo of it, it, they're just not aligned. And the difference in, in, in the social construct around it versus the science of it is just so stark um, that it's, am it's amazing to me. Um, and so it makes you feel wildly uncomfortable and also it's science. So that's kind of the, the kind of squeaked out <laughs> thing. Okay, uh, and uh, we do have, we have a question about the age range for uh, the little homo sapien scientist. Uh, let's see. It's there's nothing that I would say is like flat out inappropriate in it, um, in the sense of like, you know, there's no like graphic sex or graphic violence or, you know, really anything like that. Um, it's just uh, the themes are a little bit heavy uh, and it's kind of dark and sad. Um, so I would say maybe not for an elementary schooler. Um, and, you know, I don't know if an elementary schooler would actually be interested to read it anyway. Um, I think certainly, you know, a teenager could handle it just fine and, and that would be fine. Um, it is like I, I do uh, because it's, it's a very queer book. Um, I do. I, I sometimes have seen it like recommended for queer people. And but then like sometimes when I'm put it, you know, when I'm putting it forth as a queer book, I always want to include the um, caveat that it is dark and it is sad. Because like a lot of times, uh, queer readers uh, really want to be reading books that have like a bit more happiness to them because there, there's been so much queer tragedy in fiction. Um, so that's just a little bit of a, a content warning. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I hope that answers the question. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's I don't think there's anything that's like pointedly objectionable, but just maybe like interest level and um, you know uh, the heaviness mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, and as I was reading it, I was like, this is gonna work out. Uh <laughs> And then it did not work out. Um, so um, this was directed at Becky, but I think both of you are, are there films or TV shows right now that you think have interesting physics? And I would also say um, math, uh, science. So interesting STEM concepts, uh, shows that are getting it right. It's, it's hard. Um, I think part of the problem is I just have been watching a lot of comfort television, <laughs> and so I haven't been watching a ton of new stuff. Um, and like, it, it, I've been rewatching Buffy and things like that. And it's it's um, it's fun for me to see kind of how physics applies, um, particularly Buffy, which is to me fascinating at how well they apply rules. Um, so not necessarily physics specifically, but they have a set of rules in which this hybrid fantastic and real world operates and it's um really well done so you don't feel broken out of the story and you've kind of accepted this hey the kids could turn into hyenas we're cool with that and also they're still kids in high school and i love both i love that they effectively had an interplay between that um i really liked warrior nun um which was to me fascinating as well the powers that she had um were interesting and also limited which was cool so she didn't have universal power. Um, she could, you know, go go transport through things, but there was a limit to it. She had to train. Um, I liked the idea in Warrior Nun that she had to build up getting used to her powers. Um, it was also just uh, a satisfying story um, from just a narrative point of view because it wasn't this, uh, you know, young girl gets powers, accepts powers, fights demons. It was um, a lot more complicated than that, and it really explored her complicated relationship with getting powers, and I thought that that was wonderful. But I liked that she had to, she didn't, she didn't just immediately get power. She really had to build up and learn, and there were um, certain aspects that uh, they did a good job really 
incorporating some science into, uh, particularly her going through walls, she couldn't navigate. And that was a really cool twist that, yeah, if you're in the middle of a wall, you can't navigate. And I liked that that became part of the plot. Um, so I really liked that one as well. And my rewatch of Buffy um, is also going well. They're, they're very similar. Warrior Nun is similar to Buffy, but not derivative, which I love. Uh, I know this is going to be one of those questions where, like, as soon as we finish this event, I'm going to think of, like, 12 examples. Um, I've also been doing a lot of, like, rewatching and comfort watching lately. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble thinking. I know there's stuff, you know, that I would recommend in this vein, but I'm not sure. Um, I have been watching a lot of Wuxia lately. For, um, for those who aren't familiar, Wuxia is a, it's a Chinese genre of uh, martial arts film that is, uh, it has fantasy elements to it a little bit, but it's not really obviously fantasy, but it's, uh, so for example, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, um, it, it, that's a bit more fantastical even than Wuxia is. It's more like, there's another genre called Xianxia that's like a little bit more fantasy even. Um, but Wuxia tends to be like the wire work types of Kung Fu, which aren't strictly realistic, right? Like it is, you know, as a speculative fiction writer and fan, I'm like, I'm very on board with calling literally everything science fiction and fantasy if it's even like the least bit. <laughs> um, so it is, you know, it is speculative. You know, they're they're able to jump up on top of houses and like knock trees over by, you know, through the air just by gesturing at them and stuff. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that uh, that's necessarily um, accurate or realistic. But I do think it's an interesting marriage of convention, like storytelling convention with acceptable physics, like Becky was saying, with like what we what we see and doesn't take us out of the plot or doesn't disturb us in the rules that the world has set up. Um, so I think that's absolutely fascinating and um, and it leans on different uh, cultural conventions than maybe uh, a lot of like Western Hollywood TV and movies. Um, and then let's see, there was something else I was going to mention, and uh, I think it has completely deserted me. Oh, yes, um, Sherlock Holmes adaptations. I'm really into Sherlock Holmes adaptations. Um, again, I don't know that I would call it realistic what Sherlock Holmes is able to do, um, but you know, there have been some very interesting things that it adapted in a very physics and math type way, like the, the Robert Downey Jr. version where he's like thinking through the calculations as he's fighting somebody, which is very much like what my heroine does, actually, for her whole superpower. Um, but there's um, there's a newer one that I, I recently started watching, which is Miss Sherlock, uh, which is a Japanese version. And I think it's the first version to have both Sherlock and Watson uh, be women in this adaptation. And obviously, they're both Japanese women. It's a Japanese TV show. Um, and uh, it's so clever. Like, it's Miss Sherlock is the protagonist. And then... Uh, her Watson, her name is Watto, and they, the Japanese honorific is San, so she's Watto-san, Watson, which I think is so clever. <laughs> um, and she does all the, like, the deductive powers and stuff like that. So I don't know if that counts as a physics or math superpower, but I feel like it's in the, it's in the genre. It's in that range. Uh, so yeah, Miss Sherlock as a Sherlock Holmes adaptation, and I'm pretty excited about Enola Holmes, which I think is not out yet. But that's another one coming up that stars, uh, I think, his sister or niece or yeah, something. Yeah, another their know, younger one. sister. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's that's Stranger with things. eleven from. Uh, yeah. From. Ah. Yes. Stranger yeah, things. I'm excited yeah. about that one too. So, um, as we're uh, getting more questions coming in, I have a question for you as well. So you you are both writers, you've both done, uh, you know, fiction as well as, Becky, you've done extensive nonfiction, and you both have, uh, I would say, non-writing paths. So what did your, what does science, what does math, what does sword play do to inform the way that you write or lessons that you've learned from these other aspects of your career uh, that have taught you about writing? So I guess this is more about science communication in general. Um, but one of my favorite things, when I was in grad school, one of my best friends um, had a daughter. And as you know, Sophie was growing up, um, there'd be questions that, uh, that you know, Sarah would just be like, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, let's ask Aunt Becky. 
And so as I got more nieces and nephews, um, there became more and more Aunt Becky questions. And people were just like, I don't know, that's an Aunt Becky question. And so I had to figure out ways to take these like really complicated and amazing questions, like why are there whirlpools in the bathtub drain? And like, why can I see my reflection in like polished wood, but it's not a mirror? And like these really complicated questions and explain it to a five-year-old. And, and I had to do this regularly. And the, the fact that I could come up with kind of how to talk in a way that used real life experiences that they would have and on a level that they would understand um, and really started, it helped me really think about my audience in a way I hadn't before. Um, Cause up till then really my audience had been other physicists. And so all of a sudden I really had to think about it in a way of where's my audience coming from? What do they want to know? What's going to be words they understand? Um, and figure out how to have this idea of an audience in my mind as I wrote. Um, and I kept that when I was writing Spectra. It's like, well, what's, what's going to be interesting? Like, what do you, what do these, what does my audience want to hear about? What are they already doing? Um, just a lot of audience research to figure out what they wanted. Um, and it, that idea of an imagined audience was almost like made writing the Game of Thrones book awful because all I could hear is everyone at twi on Twitter yelling at me for doing zombies wrong and stuff. Um, so that backfired. But the idea of like having this audience of Game of Thrones fans, what do they want? What, what, what's going on in the forums? What, what questions do they want answered? Um, and so really being the one to explain physics concepts to people around me um, helped me figure out how to explain complex things at a level people want to hear. I completely agree with everything you're saying. Like science communication and science accessibility is so important. And I mean, one of the things that I was really trying to do with the cast books is um, have it be accessible, have it be fun for people. And uh, even if they're not math people at all, have them come with me on this this thrill ride where I'm reveling in this joy of mathematics and they can share that with me and have fun with it. And and I feel like I have succeeded with that. Readers will come up to me and they'll they'll be like, I'm not a math person, I'm sorry. They always apologize. They're like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> you don't have to be a math person. They'll say, but I loved your book. And I love that. You know, I, I love sharing that love of science and math. And, and the fun of it, the fun of swordplay, the fun of uh, fight scenes, and the fun of, of science. And I think, um, you know, doing stunt work and stuff uh, has really helped me in terms of imbuing that in terms of narrative. Because, um, you know, I've also done a little bit of real fighting and uh, like ring fighting type stuff. And it's fast. You don't see what's going on. Like, if you compare fencing with sword fighting is a good example of this. If you watch Olympic fencing, I mean, I find it very interesting, but it's also very fast. It's hard to see what's going on. There's no drama and emotion in it. I mean, I guess unless you watch a documentary about fencers' lives, but, like, if you're just watching the match, you know. Um, and... I want to, I love the idea of marrying that, uh, that emotion, those emotional stakes, which is so important to us in stunt work. It's like more important than the moves is what, what story are we telling with this fight? What emotions are we telling with this action scene? Um, and marrying that in with the, the science communication and, and joy of that. And just like sharing all the things I love with everybody, like and having people read the books and it improve their day. You know, I think that's that's the greatest thing about being a writer when you can write something so fun and escapist using science and using action that people are like, this this took me out of my head for a while and, and I, I had a good time. You know, that's there's power in that. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. OK, we have another question um, about uh, children's literature that can act as a springboard for science, um, fiction, fiction that allows you to experience different types of science or get in uh, different aspects of careers. So do you have any recommendations for uh, people watching? I'm sure Becky would know a lot more than I do, but um, my big gateway to science was Wrinkle in Time, the Wrinkle in Time series by Madeline Le Engel. Like, I learned what mitochondria are from those books. So that's the first thing I think of. But I, uh, Becky, I think you're you're muted. I'm not hearing you. Oh, no, you're. Oh, sorry. Yes, I also <laughs> learned what mitochondria were from, from that. <laughs> um, I, that was also a word I learned. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah, and the I did I I will second that. And Wrinkle in Time still excellent reread as an adult. Um, all of the Many Waters was excellent, and she also um, looks at the interplay between science and religion in a way that I think is very cool. Um, and uh, I will say I saw the um, the movie Wrinkle in Time. And it was amazing watching a dad explain. It, it, this was just one minor plot point, but watching a dad explain physics to his daughter in a way where there was no like, oh, let me. It, there was no like talking down to her. It was very. It, and I. It was just like you know goosebumps to see on screen a dad not talking down, but kind of exploring with his daughter and that was to me like oh yeah there was also a great movie but like that's the scene that that stuck out to me and I love that they made that part of the movie um and so I yeah Madeline Langle's books are awesome I got to see her speak once and it was incredible um graphic novel wise um Max Axiom is pretty good um it doesn't have a lot of good representation so uh I wouldn't necessarily recommend that um too strongly but it's got some great science for littler kids, um, Magic Treehouse and Magic School Bus are awesome. So the Magic School Bus is incredible. Um, the amount I learned from about like the digestive system from Magic School Bus just while I was babysitting kids was great. Um, so that the the you know Miss Frizzle series is is I think really solid and really holds up. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of the other ones, um, but I really liked those. Um, Max Axiom is pretty good. Um, I, there's a lot of stuff coming out now that's about real life scientists, particularly real life female scientists, um, and that's neat. Uh, hearing about a lot of kind of the unsung heroes, um, and there's some amazing female scientists out there um, that now have stories written about them. Um, yeah, I think those are kind of yeah. The the Madeline Langle I think was a big one for me. Um, and being able to, uh, as well, and being able to to talk about the physics concepts, the science concepts, and that interplay between science and religion. Oh my gosh! Ooh, and like, I, I first learned about higher dimensions from those books too. I was like, this is blowing my mind. It's amazing. <laughs> I know. I like the um, the whole tesseract idea. And um, so when I was in grad school, I actually did. Um, looked at buckling surfaces and it was a lot of differential geometry and so that idea of going and looked at stuff in four spatial dimensions computationally and so um, I actually used a clip from the Simpsons episode where Simpson Homer goes into 3D um, in my dissertation defense because that's what I was asking people to do with their brains is go you know this is what it was like watching someone 2D going into 3D now I'm asking you to go from 3D into 4D, and it's just as hard, and it, there's no easy explanation. And I loved that um, that Madeline Langille took you through that. Well, so, and yeah. I will uh, <laughs> do a shameless plug then also for STEM Read, uh, my program, stemread.com. So we have tons of resources that are free online where you can check out uh, awesome fiction books and then explore the science behind the fiction. So we've got expert videos and interviews and lesson plans and online games. So all of that is on stemread.com. But but it's not about me. It's about you two. So uh, I have uh, one, one final question to wrap it up. So it, these are difficult times, I'd say. Uh, I think we don't need to uh, argue about that. But um, what do you want to see both coming out of science, coming out of technology, coming out of fiction in the next 50 to 100 years? What's what's your hope for the future? Uh, I mean, carbon capture, a way to, you know, e either stall or reverse climate change right now. Um, it, for, if we're talking 50 to 100 years, because we need that now. Um, I mean, if we don't do that now, then I don't know where we're going to be in 50 to 100 years. Um, much shorter term, uh, really an understanding of, um, of uh, how diseases spread um, and vector, you know, the, and, 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 and a lot of um, that epidemiology so that people understand the importance of staying home and wearing masks. Um, and I'd love to see a way to communicate that um, in a way that's widely accepted, but I think that would be a superpower um, as well. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's possible, but the the short term, just a, a understanding of disease spread and what we can do. Um, longer term, just 
ways to reverse climate change. I, I don't know what else, like that, that's what I'd like. Um, I mean, definitely seconded on those things. Um, and medicine in general, I feel like there's so much we have not yet conquered that we're not yet good at in terms of medicine. And a lot of times where, you know, we're treating the symptoms rather because that's all we can do. And there's a lot we don't understand. I would love to see medical advances on the level of like vaccinations, but for like a whole bunch more aspects of, of uh, human illness. Um, and in terms of fiction, I would, I'm not sure how to say this in a, a few words, so I'll just throw some things out there and see if uh, it lands, is uh, what we were talking about with representation before in terms of people getting to tell their stories and there being a lot more, uh, some path to equality on that. I mean, it, it's going to be very fraught. It already is. Um, but also, you know, geographic equality is something that is also stymieing things like uh, racial equality in publishing in that, you know, the U.S. is so, um, such a behemoth in the publishing world that, you know, a lot of countries uh, don't even see their own literature being highlighted, you know, in favor of books from the U.S. and translations from English and stuff uh, taking over local bo books in non-Anglophone spaces. Um, I would like to see a lot more going in the other direction. I want to see a lot more translations in the U.S. market, which uh, I think we are we are getting more of that. Um, but it's like it's always a fight every step of the way um, and, and a lot of work from a lot of people, um, which I guess is always how, how progress happens. Um, but I, I would like to see us uh, re figure out this sort of like path forward in these woods that we're in, in terms of equalizing this playing field more and more. And I, I'm not even sure what form that will take, but it's something I really want to see. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I want to thank you so much for being with us tonight. It was a really interesting talk. I. You know, I say this all the time, but I could do these for hours, but I know people have other things that they have to get to. So thank you very much for your time, Rebecca C. Thompson and S.L. Huang. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and thank you again to our panelists. Thanks so much for having us, Jillian, for moderating, and thanks, everybody, for thank coming. You.